as we continue in this series on the church that Jesus really wants. Or as I prefer to say, Jesus wants his church back. In study number seven, we want to look at whether in the Bible, Jesus wanted to have churches that were run by synods in huge organizations, or did he want an organism, a living, vibrant body? And at the heart of the leadership within that body, within that organism, are fivefold ministries of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are ministry gifts that express the ministry of Jesus himself. I mean, he's the great apostle. Uh, he's the, the great prophet. He's the great teacher. He's the great evangelist. Uh, he's the, uh, the great shepherd. There is no ministry that would ever compare or be equal to Jesus. But Jesus wanted to impart these ministry gifts to the church. And in Ephesians chapter 4, we find that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave gifts to men in Ephesians 4 and, and verse 8. And these gifts are expressed to us as the type of ministry that is going to build, develop, and mature the body of Christ. In the natural world of science, we read that there are five major food groups. I learned this when I was in Indonesia because in the health centers, they had these posters up. Uh, you know, three types of food was meant you were malnourished. You needed four to be healthy, five to be perfect. Now, those food groups, you know, carbohydrates, protein, dairy products, fruit and vegetables, fats and sugars. But if you had to have just one type of food every day, the same food, for example, fried rice, I love fried rice, but if you had to have fried rice every day, every morning, every lunchtime, every dinner time, every Monday to Sunday, and this was your only food, you would very quickly become bored and also you would become malnourished because you wouldn't be getting the necessary uh, vitamins and proteins and, and minerals that we need for our natural development and growth and our health. Well, as we continue to look at this particular study, and we remember what we've looked at in uh, the previous studies, we've looked at how the church, it really began fantastic. There was great evangelism, there was great reaching out to, uh, to the multitudes, but what happened? By the end of the first century, there was serious decline that was taking place. We saw that the decline of the church, you know, after the crucifixion of Christ in 30 AD, and, and we go down through the apostolic age, down into the mid-60s. Uh, we find that in 64 AD, Paul was killed. 65 AD, uh, Peter was killed. And in 100 AD, John passed away, the last of the original 12 now, we know that there were other apostles as well, but the original 12 were all gone. And in that period of time, we found that the decline had begun to take place. In fact, Paul said, all Asia has left me. There was a tremendous, terrible uh, abandonment of the principles taught by Jesus and the early apostles. The church left eldership, fivefold ministries, speaking in tongues, the new song, the royal priesthood, faith as the foundation of Christian life, the authority of the Bible. And the church began to practice a priestly tribe, having a pastor instead of a kingdom of priests, a hierarchy, a, a, a papal system began to develop. 
Infant baptism replaced believers' baptism. A sacramental system was established. Letters of indulgence to get forgiveness um, of sins or uh, a shorter period of time in purgatory. And this continued down to the time of 1517 when Martin Luther began to bring about a reformation. In 1517, Martin Luther went to the church door in Wittenberg and he posted his 95 theses on the door. His, his protest against what had been happening in the church, the decline of the church, the turning away from the authority of the word of God. And Martin Luther released a powerful force where God began to bring restoration in the church. By 1521, we see that the Anabaptist movement began to restore believers' baptism. They still baptized by sprinkling, but they insisted only believers could get baptized. In the 1700s, there was holiness movements and more restoration was taking place. In the 1800s, we find that there was a New Testament church movement and a Matthew 28 movement and the gospel started going out to the, um, to the nations. In 1900, we had the restoration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 1948, the latter rain revival, which brought a new perspective on the perfection of the church, the restoration of singing in the spirit, a whole move of God that God wanted to bring into the church. In the 1960s, the charismatic renewal restored the gifts of the Holy Spirit into a more functioning uh, operation within uh, the church. In the 1980s, we had the apostolic and prophetic movements, the 1040 uh, window movement, and the restoration has continued on since that time. And God is restoring a true perspective of the body of Christ and the true priesthood within the church, whether every member priesthood, the all saints ministry of the church, and these days, in 2021, we find that this restoration is continuing. Well, the Apostle Peter, he preached about this restoration that must take place. And we see this in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive. Heavens must hold back until the times of restoration of all things, all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. See, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were sinless sinlessly perfect. They were only babes. They still weren't at the level of the fullness of what God wanted to bring them to, but they were sinlessly perfect until the fall. And the power of the cross wants to bring us back in full restoration, not just to be sinlessly perfect, but to be transformed and conformed to the image of Christ, to have the divine nature of Christ imparted to us through the new birth, through the processing of the Holy Spirit, through the word of God growing and developing within us until we come into the fullness of the image um, of Jesus. Back in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel faced judgment and they lost the blessings of God, we find that there were prophecies of the restoration of all that had been lost. The same principle applies today. In Joel 2 and verse 25, we read, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. So the Lord said, I'm going to restore everything that was taken away. And when we read in Joel chapter 2, we see this was also prophetic of the bringing in of the early and latter rain, the full restoration of God's word and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this chapter is quoted on the day of Pentecost. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, Jesus also, he calls 
for the church to be restored. He calls for the church to return to the original vision, pathway, pattern that he established through his uh, apostles. In Revelation 2 and verse 5, he's talking to the Apostle John and telling the Apostle John to write messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor. In Revelation 2 and verse 5, it says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. We need restoration. We need to return to the original heart of the vision that Jesus was preaching. These fivefold ministries that Jesus gave to the church were not just given for the first century. They were given until the church fulfilled the full vision and the heart that's in the heart of the Father and the heart of the Son and the heart of the Holy Spirit. And apostles and prophets in particular, they're the foundation layers. And in Ephesians 2, 19 to 21, we read about the foundations that Jesus was establishing in the church. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Ephesians 3, 4 to 5, we find that Paul continues. When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. See, the apostles and prophets, they were the forerunners, the foundation layers, so that the church could be built. And in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, we see the apostles and prophets together with uh, teachers, evangelists and, and, and pastors were a vital part of developing the church to be in the fullness of the image of Christ. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint, every person, every part supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. See, this fivefold ministry was given to be able to equip every member of the church. The unity of the body of Christ, the growth and expansion of the body of Christ to fulfill its potential in fulfilling the apostolic commission and the great commission, it needs every member of the body to be fully equipped, fully anointed, fully invested in the revelation of God's word, that we might grow in Christ, that we might be like Christ, that we might fulfill his heart and his passion in this, in this day and age. You see, these apostles and prophets, these foundation layers within the church, Paul tells us when he's talking about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? The answer is obviously no. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. You see, 
Apostles, this is not a hierarchy where you've got apostles at the top and then you've got prophets under them and you've got teachers under them. No, it's talking about the priority in their ministry function. Who goes in to pioneer first? It's the apostles and then the prophets. And the prophets, they come in as ones who bring confirmation to that apostolic vision and mission. Then the teachers follow. They come to give order and understanding uh, what all of this, this means. And that's followed with uh, pastoral ministries and evangelistic ministries, administrations uh, within the church. You see, the apostles and prophets, they went in first to lay the foundations. And this is why we have not just the Great Commission, we have the Apostolic Commission. And this is what Paul talked about in Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 28. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission, that's the apostolic commission, God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, to present everyone perfect, teleos, in Christ. He wants us to reach that perfection of the fullness of the image of Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, that's the Great Commission. So we've got the Apostolic Commission and we've got the Great Commission. The Apostolic Commission is to bring to maturity and full understanding of the vision and potential and capacity that every believer has to equip them to fulfill that work. The Great Commission is to make sure that everyone hears the gospel and that people of every nation have the opportunity to be discipled as a a disciple of Christ, to follow Christ and to be like him. Now, who are these apostles? I mean, are there apostles today? Yes, of course they are. We haven't yet fulfilled uh, in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. We haven't yet come to that perfect unity. We haven't yet come to the full maturity in Christ. We are still being tossed to and fro by all various kinds of doctrines. And the church needs to grow up into maturity. We still need apostles and prophets today, but a lot of confusion as to what apostles are. You know, apostles are not some super giants. Being an apostle is a function in the church. It's not some title. That's why we don't read the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John. No, we read it the other way around. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle. Uh, John, an apostle. It's talking about their function. They had a leadership role, a, a role, it's almost like spiritual architects, beginning to put the church together, to equip and to lead the church. Not titles, not ranks, but men fully devoted to the mission of Christ, of bringing Christ to the nations of bringing every individual to the full potential that they have in Christ. So who are the apostles? Apostles are sent ones, bearing a special message and authority. That's the meaning of the, the word apostolos in the Greek. They represent the kingdom of God and they bring Christ's authority and message to his body, like we see in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 20. Apostles are foundation layers and foundation repairers so the church may have strong foundations and healthy growth. And we can see this in Ephesians 2, 19 to 21 and Acts 19, 1 to 7. Apostles are pioneers opening new fields to the gospel. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 16, he didn't want to go where others had preached the gospel. He wanted to go into new fields. Apostles initiate divine strategy so that the eternal purpose of God might be fulfilled. As we read in Colossians 1, uh, 23 to 29, and Paul really fought and struggled to see that this would actually come to pass. 
Now these apostles, they pray, plan and strategize so that Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth will be impacted by the Great Commission. Apostles, hmm, they have a vision. They're not just aimlessly out there preaching and, and using some authority. No, they have a vision, ministry and capacity of bringing believers together across denominations with the goal of uniting the body of Christ, just like Paul expressed in 1 Corinthians 1.10. Apostles are leaders and imparters of divine vision to other leaders and to the whole of the church, as we see in Acts 20, 17 to 37, and Peter in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. Apostles are also spiritual fathers, revealing the heart of God the Father, who wants to gather the family in unity and to bring them to full maturity so that all may achieve their full potential. And you can read that in 1 Corinthians 4, 15 and 1 John 2, 13 to 14 to see the spirit of their fatherhood. What about the prophets? Well, um, when we look at the prophets, we'll see that there's three different kinds of prophetic ministry. These three levels of prophetic ministry. They are very important in making sure that every member of the body of Christ is involved. Firstly, all believers can prophesy. But they prophesy one by one, not all at the same time. One by one, sharing a message from the Lord, as it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 31. This is a prophetic anointing in the church to bring edification and exhortation and comfort. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 3. But secondly, there are others that are specially anointed and given a gift of prophecy. Some believers are given this special gift of prophecy, not everybody. I mean, all may prophesy, but the special gift of prophecy is just to some. Its function in the church is limited to two or three messages in a service. And others need to carefully weigh up what was said. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10, and 1 Corinthians 14, 29. But thirdly, apart from all can prophesy, or that there are those who have the gift of prophecy, there is also the ministry of the prophet. These are the ascension gift ministry of prophets. These prophets function alongside apostles and other ministries in the fivefold ascension gift ministry team, as we read in Ephesians 4.11 and Ephesians 2.20 and Ephesians 3 verse 5. All prophecy needs to be tested. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 to 21, Matthew 7.15. You see, we can't just have people running around doing all kinds of prophecies. Prophecy must be tested. The prophetic ministry strengthens the apostolic ministry and we need to make sure it's on course. And it's the reason we often see a prophet accompanying an apostle in the New Testament ministry of the church. We can see that in Acts 11, 27 to 30, 13, 1 to 3, 15, 30 to 33, 21, 10 to 11, 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21, and 2 Peter 3 and verse 2. The apostle is like the pioneer. The prophet is like the quality control to make sure that the uh, apostle is actually walking on the right pathway. They work together as a team. Now, the relationship between the fivefold ministries and local church leadership, the elders. Now, we've looked at eldership in the past. In the last several studies, we touched upon how every local church was shepherded, pastored by the elders. The five ministries are all elders, but not all elders are part of the fivefold ministries. See, all elders must be able to, uh, you know, to, uh, to rule, you know, but there's a special capacity in ruling, and that's given to the apostle. That's a ministry gift. All elders must be able to evangelize. But there's a special capacity in evangelism. That's the evangelist, the ministry of the evangelist. All elders must be able to prophesy. But there's a special capacity in pro uh, prophetic ministry, and that's the ministry of the prophet. All elders must be able to, to shepherd. But there's those that have a special capacity in that 
area. And they're the ones who have the ministry gift of being a pastor. And all elders must be able to teach. But there are those who have a special capacity. And that's the ministry of the teacher. The all elders, they represent the local leadership. But the fivefold ministry, these specialists, they are equippers to equip the body of Christ. And they are leadership to the whole of the body of Christ. When we look at some of the ministries that are mentioned in the New Testament church, we see that John was an elder, 2 John 1 verse 1, 3 John 1 verse 1, the elder, the presbyteros. Peter was an elder, 1 Peter 5 verse 1, he said, I who am a fellow elder, yeah, the sum presbyteros. Paul and Timothy were elders in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 1 and 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. They were ambassadors for Christ. And the word there is presbyomen. The 24 apostolic leaders of the heavenly church in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, like in Revelation 4 verse 4, are also called elders or presbyteros. Now we come to the point of looking at the church councils in church history. There are seven major ecumenical councils that started off this whole process. The first of these was the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. The second one, the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. The third, the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. The fourth, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. The fifth one, the Second Council of Constantinople in 553 AD. The sixth one, the Third Council of Constantinople from 680 to 681 AD. And the seventh one, the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 AD. These seven councils attempted to restore peace, reach a consensus and develop a unified faith, but more and more, they became instruments of control in doctrine and practice. And they began to be controlled by individual uh, church denominations, particularly after the splits in the church, the schisms that took place in church history. But where did these councils have their origin? Well, actually, they have their origin back in Acts chapter 15 in Jerusalem. And we read there from uh, some of these verses in the early part of um, Acts chapter 15. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. This first council of the church ended up being a revelation of the divine wisdom of God. And it released the Gentiles into the gospel. It released the apostle Paul and Barnabas to continue on with the work they were doing amongst the uh, non-Jewish nations um, of the world. In the New Testament church, we see that from Ephesus 4 and 1 Timothy 3, the elders and the fivefold ministries had their functions where the elders were bringing the uh, congregation. They were shepherding the local church in unity, building them up in their faith, encouraging them to walk in the apostolic uh, doctrines. They were walking by faith and teaching them to grow and to function in the gifts and the callings and to fulfill their potential. But then from amongst those elders, there were those who were part of the fivefold ministries and they would travel from city to city, from congregation to congregation, building up the whole of the body of Christ. 
this chart shows us exactly the sort of movements that they had. The elders were local, but the fivefold ministries were traveling ministries that traveled around the world. But you know, eventually, this gave way to a system of synods. As different people tried to uh, grab power, to control the direction that the church was going in. See, the church had been a priesthood of all believers, and when you came together for, uh, for church, many different people might prophesy, speak in tongues, have gifts of the, the Holy Spirit, lay hands on the sick, miracles were happening, and many, many people were getting saved. But some people were nervous. And especially after Caesar had become uh, a Christian and the Roman Empire endorsed Christianity, well, now you had to have trained religious leaders. Many different doctrines had arisen, and these doctrines um, had to be, uh, let's say, codified and uniformed. So they had these councils. And then in different areas of authority where the churches were established we have the formation of synods in history these were ecclesiastical councils that led the church there's three major models the first one is episcopal which emphasized divine appointment from above the second was presbyterian emphasizing elderships as the governing authority of the church. And the third was congregational, emphasizing the priesthood of all believers as a voting body who could vote in um, their leaders. So the formation of these sinners, which originally, there was only one global church, but it's the merger of the Roman Byzantine Empire with the Roman church strengthened and there were diversities of doctrines being taught. The councils were called to provide a clear statement of the Christian faith. Later development saw these councils become the governing bodies of various denominations as the church splintered and, and the term synod became more popular as the term to describe the governing body of the denomination. Other terms of similar meaning also existed, e.g. The, the governing assembly or the, the council, etc., but you know, all of this eventually led down and all of these changes, the councils and the schisms began to produce a history of bloodshed within the church. In 388 AD, Caesar Theodosius forbade religious discussion by non-clergy. Seven years after the Council of Constantinople and they had to ban religious discussion by the members of the church. Today, we try to encourage them to discuss the word of God. In 590 to 604 AD, Pope Gregory I forbade the reading of the Bible by non-clergy. Well, today we beg the people, get a Bible, read the Bible. But they wanted to stop people from knowing what was the revelation that God was wanting to give. In 1231 AD, Pope Gregory IX established the Inquisition to eliminate evangelical Christians and Jews the Inquisition continued into the 1800s. In 1517 AD, we have the Reformation and Martin Luther and the 95 Theses beginning the restoration of biblical Christianity. Wow. So what's the responsibility of the five ministries? Do we still need them today? Yes, we do. And what's recorded in Ephesians 4, 11 to 15 is just as real today as it was in the first century. Firstly, the five ministries have the responsibility to equip all the believers to do the work of ministry. Ephesians 4, 12 says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Not so that they would do all the ministry, but the people of the congregation, the members, the body of Christ would be equipped to do that ministry. Secondly, the five ministries build and bind the body of Christ together. Ephesians 4, 12 to 13, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now compare the five bars in the tabernacle of Moses in Exodus 26, 26 to 27. Those five bars were joined to bring the whole of the tabernacle, the house of God, into one. And that's what the role of the fivefold ministries is too. 
to edify, build up the body of Christ. In Exodus 26, 26 to 28, it says, And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards of the, the side of the tabernacle, for the far side westward. The middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. They held the structure together. And we need fivefold ministry teams all over the world, all throughout the body of Christ, not as some giant organization, but as a multiplication of the organism of the body of Christ, of which Jesus is the head. Thirdly, the five ministries are responsible to continue their function until we all have come to the unity of the faith. Ephesians 4.13 till we all come to the unity of the faith. Fourthly, the five ministries function to give us direction in our spiritual growth as we grow into the fullness of the image of Christ. Ephesians 4.13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Fifthly, the five ministries are important to over, uh, overcoming the attack of false doctrine. Ephesians 4.14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Sixthly, the five ministries keep our growth focused on Christ. Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ. Seventhly, the fivefold ministry Release each person to fulfill their potential. Ephesians 4.16 From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You see, we need every member of the body to be functioning. There's, there's no body that's not important. You're important. You have gifts, you have potentials, every one of you. And it's our function and role to encourage every member of the church to grow in Christ. We're not just in some sitting room waiting for the heavenly aeroplane to come and take us back home. No, we have a mission. We have a job and we need to see every member of the church equipped. But the problem, because we're not allowing the fivefold ministries to freely function, the church is malnourished. The church is hungry and they're weak. We need the transformation. That's why we had these five food groups that we looked at. If you've only got three of them, it's malnourished. Four is good, but five is perfect. We need apostles. We need prophets. We need pastors, shepherds. Uh, we need teachers, evangelists. We need these fivefold ministries so that we can be the church that Jesus wants. And Jesus wants his church back. We prepared to hand it all back to him. Father, help us, I pray, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.